Um, I'm Kathleen McMahon, a founding member of the Liam and Tom O'Flaherty Society and also their treasurer. To Anna Hossaram Tusakar, Leshan Leakshaw, or Kathleen Barrington, Le Morris Casey. For year, Niramar in Am Chocolate Kela in Or and Imriana, after Sulagong, Mammy the Rasha, Rish Aun, and Breen Chukwin. Morris is a native of County Tipperary, as I am myself. He was educated at Trinity College and he received a, an MPhil degree from Cambridge University and a DPhil from Oxford University. His um, research was on Irish women and radical internationalism from 1916 to 1939. He is the current historian in resident at EPIC the uh, Irish Immigration Museum in London, which is funded by the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs. He gave his first lecture at Fáil and the in 2017 on the forgotten women uh, who brought Limo Flaherty to the Soviet Union. These women were May O'Callaghan and uh, Nellie Cohen. Nellie Cohen later became Mrs. Rathbone and is the mother of Joyce Ratbone, Limo Flaherty's daughter. Morris today continues the biographical narrative with a lecture on Kathleen Barrington, who was married to Limo Flaherty and who was the, the mother of his daughter, Peggyn. Peggyn is still alive and living in a care home in Crewe. His research into intergenerational O'Flaherty the intergenerational O'Flaherty family is meticulous and reveals the most fascinating details. This is a wonderful lecture. Thank you, Morris, for your scholarly endeavours and we wish you a great future. We hope we will have continued involvement with the Liam and Tommy, Tom O'Flaherty Society. Ahorja Bunigi Tanavas, Guravmila Mahagwif. Hi everyone and welcome to this talk on the life of the Irish writer Margaret Barrington. It's great to be here at the uh, Lehman Tom O'Farry Festival speaking to you all this evening. Um, old friends from the festival will know me as the winner of the 2015 RTE Arena radio competition to win two tickets to the festival. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Morris J. Casey and I'm the current DFA historian in residence at EPIC, the Irish Emigration Museum. I'm also working on a book project at the moment, um, part of which looks at the intergenerational history of the O'Flaherty family. But my talk for you this evening is all about Margaret Barrington, uh, who was a talented writer in her own right, and also uh, Liam O'Flaherty's wife. So before I get into the talk, I wanted to say some thank yous, firstly to the festival itself for inviting me to speak, I'm very privileged to do so. And also I would like to thank Angus Melville, who has been enormously gracious and generous in sharing with me uh, documents and photographs that have really allowed me to, to research and write this talk on Margaret Barrington. So to begin, recently a story, uh, a short story written by Margaret Barrington was republished in the well-received Irish collection of short stories, The Art of the Glimpse, which was edited by Sinead Gleeson. And so the title of that collection the title of that collection itself has a connection to Barrington. Writing of Barrington's work, the Irish writer William Trevor noted that Barrington was particularly skilled in, quote, the art of the glimpse. Sinead Gleeson enjoyed the phrase so much that she chose it as the um, title for her collection. It's a fitting description for Barrington in more ways than one. And my talk this evening will be necessarily somewhat short because Barrington is an artist seen only in glimpses. The source material on her life is quite limited and as she left no memoirs or to my knowledge no personal archive, we must trace her through the perspectives of those around her. She appears in the letters of her husband Limo Flaherty, memories of her daughter Pegeen and read between the lines in certain elements of her own fiction. She also appears at moments in the archives of, of those who cross paths with her. Perhaps someone will take up the task of researching and writing a Barrington biography one day my own I, um, opinion would be that the sources are are, ne are somewhat limited. Um, perhaps uh, someone writing that biography uh, will encounter that also. 
I'm very open to being proven wrong on this. I hope that there is enough material to write a, a Barrington biography one day. It'll be clear from my talk this evening that my interest in Barrington really arises from her um, connection to Liam O'Flaherty and his broader family. But of course, she's more than just an auxiliary to O'Flaherty's biography. She was an extraordinarily talented writer, in addition to being an advocate for refugees and a principled pacifist and socialist throughout her life. It's not hard to imagine what would have brought O'Flaherty and Barrington together in terms of their cultural interests, their um, politics and their shared world of 1920s radical Dublin. But our story, as in begin with their relationship rather, it begins uh, with uh, Margaret, young Margaret herself, and it begins on one of Ireland's northernmost points, Malin, County Donegal. So Barrington was born in May of 1896 to a Protestant family living in Malin. Uh, it would be fair to say, I guess, that young Margaret had a, a difficult relationship with her parents growing up. Her father, who um, was known for some violent tempers, was a member of the Royal Irish Constabulary, which was a, a Redmondite, and he was also a Redmondite Irish nationalist and a convert to Catholicism. In his professional work, he was highly regarded. Barrington's mother, meanwhile, was, according to family memory, an excellent housewife and very deft with her hands, who raised her surviving daughters into superb cooks. Yet with her mother, too, young Margaret would have um, a somewhat difficult relationship. Due to illness, she spent a formative part of her childhood under the care of her grandfather. And her grandfather was a red-bearded miller who nurtured an autodidactic interest in mathematics and the Irish language. Family memory notes once more that this grandfather could remember the famine and that they could never bake maize bread in his house because he could not bear the smell and brought it all back. It has been all it had been all there was for the country people. So this grandfather seems to have been quite a remarkable figure, and it's unsurprising that this Irish speaking, self educated Protestant intellectual in rural Donegal would leave a mark on young Margaret. He wrote scholarly papers and ma on mathematics and Irish and used his linguistic talents for what we might now call a cross-community initiative. He helped his Irish-speaking Catholic neighbours rehearse their confession in English. So Margaret's education, um, her early education included a convent school in Valencia, Dublin's Alexandra School, Dungannon Schools, and also a year spent in Normandy, which is particularly impactful. She disliked the what she termed the uh, repressive atmosphere of Alexandria in particular, but found great joy in France, where, her daughter Pegeen remembers, Margaret first became aware of her own beauty and rejoiced in the warmth and happy acceptance of life she found in France. She would remain a lifelong Francophile. So after this early education, Barrington would go on to study French and German at Trinity College Dublin. Um, of course, uh, linguistic education being uh, the kind of gender dynamics of education in the period often funneling women into um, language study, which is why you have so many uh, talented women translators uh, during this period in the early 20th century. So in Trinity College Dublin, she was taken under the wings of Professor Thomas Brown, Rudmose Brown, who was the Professor of Romance Languages at Trinity. Staff to student ratio, ratios of that era facilitated impactful personal connections between um, mentor and mentee. Uh, Margaret Barrington um, benefited from this. It's uh, difficult to trace what precise influence Rudmose Brown had on Barrington beyond noting simply that he was influential in expanding her intellectual horizons. But it is interesting to note that this same professor, Rudmose Brown, had a major influence on another French-speaking Trinity alumni of the era, era uh, that's Sam, uh, Samuel Beckett, who uh, also um, regarded Rudmose Brown as, as one of his, his early champions. And this professor was, according to Roger Little, an individualist and non-conformist who possessed a fierce independence of spirit towards all attempts at blinkering the mind. In the midst of this intellectual tutelage under a liberal-minded mentor, Margaret Barrington's education at Trinity College Dublin also coincided with the First World War and the revolutionary events that would reshape uh, modern Ireland. So it's time then to turn for the first time to um, Margaret Barrington's 1939 novel, My Cousin Justin. Um, it's, of course, it's a novel, it's a work of fiction, but it is uh, does seem to contain many semi-autobiographical elements. And to that end, um, 
I considered a useful source for the life of Margaret Barrington. So in the novel, the main character, Luli, bears a lot of resemblances in politics, temperament and timeline to Barrington herself. Luli, like Barrington, is a woman from Rory Dun rural, rural Donegal who escapes her picturesque rural confines to study at Trinity College Dublin on the eve of the Irish Revolution. This passage, which I'm going to quote from now, describes Luli's start at university, and it surely draws on Barrington's own memories of insurrectionary Dublin. Luli is at home when the Easter Rising takes place, but returns to the city shortly after the execution of the leaders of the Rising. In a first-person narrative that serves to emphasise that sense of authenticity and blur the barriers of fiction, Barrington writes, Dublin was smouldering when I encountered it. O'Connell Street lay in ruins. Everywhere there was the rank smell of burning and stale ashes. Even though, even through the rain, the smoke still rose from some of the buildings. Companies of soldiers marched through the streets and groups stood here and there on guard. Most of the shops were still closed. The city was in mourning. A feeling of horror and dread took hold of me. The war had caught us up. I saw that beneath the casual indifference of these people, beneath their quiet good humour, there was an inflexible spirit. There must be something to bring about this upheaval, to rouse a small group of men against the mightiest power on earth. Talk of German gold was so much nonsense that took in no one, not even those who professed to bleed. I began to buy revolutionary newspapers and pamphlets. I became interested in the work and writings of James Connolly, and I was not the only one. Small groups began to spring up simultaneously. Books were passed around and read. Arguments, bitter and mature arguments, broke out among the students in the club, which often ended in reviling and personal abuse. Meanwhile, the war went on. The lists of dead and wounded continued to come in. It was my professor who brought me back to my senses. He sent for me. I went along to his rooms, wondering what was in store for me. He gave me a cup of tea and talked of those things which were at the moment of greatest importance to me, politics and religion, but in a more universal way than I had yet heard them discussed. So in this an excerpt from my cousin Justin, we can read the influence of Oliver Mose Brown and of the events and ideas which engulfed Ireland in the years following 1916. There's an interesting sidelight to Barrington's um, time in revolutionary Dublin. Her uh, RIC father was the last servant of the crown to arrest Constance Markovich. The rebel countess, who was by that point a friend of Margaret Barrington, told her that it had been a pleasure to be arrested by her polite father, who ensured that a comfortable passage was organised for her on her journey from Dublin to imprisonment in Holloway Prison. So Barrington in these years, at the, towards the end of the First World War and into the 1920s, was um, finding her intellectual and literary voice, uh, but she would also find a husband. Um, indeed, scandalous for the time, she would find husbands plural. In 1922, Margaret Barrington married Edmund Curtis, and the pair likely met through Trin Trinity College Dublin. Curtis, who was uh, about 15 years older than Barrington, was a professor of history at Trinity, uh, focusing largely on um, Ireland in the medieval period, though so he did publish kind of these large survey histories. And Patrick Malm's uh, biographical sketch of Curtis for the Dictionary of Irish Biography presents him as a somewhat frustrated individual. Um, Curtis was born in Lancashire to Irish parents, but the Curtis family fell from financial grace, and thus young Edmund had to apply his intellectual talents to navigate what meritocracy existed in turn of the century England. Curtis um, had an interest and respect uh, for Guelphic regions and wrote for the Irish Review, a journal edited by Thomas McDonough and Joseph Plunkett. Despite some um, political and cultural shared interests, the marriage uh, between Margaret Barrington and Edmund Curtis was uh, troubled from the outset. Barrington's daughter Pergeen recalls that her mother never spoke of Edmund Curtis without irritation. And in the short time span of their marriage, Curtis and Barrington attended the literary salons hosted by the Irish nationalist, mystic and cooperative leader, George Russell, otherwise known as A.E. George Russell would become a space where Barrington could expand her literary contacts and, as it transpired, dissolve her marriage to Curtis. So it's here with um, characteristic destructive potential that Liam O'Flaherty enters our story. 
In March 1924, Liam O'Farrity wrote to the literary editor, Edward Garnes, um, who was a great early champion of Liam O'Farrity's writing, and he began, My dearest friend, let me see now where do we begin. Yes, the best place to begin is with a description of my visit to George Russell yesterday evening. He keeps open house on Sunday nights and about 20 people gather there, people connected with art and literature. Stevens, the novelist, was there, a nice enough fellow, but rather proud of himself, denunciatory of the Russians, and very much of the pattern of Robert Lind, Squire, and those people. We got on well, however, which I affected by keeping my mouth shut and agreeing with him on every point, even to the extent of saying that Chekhov was very much overrated. Then there was a Professor Curtis. Curtis, expansive, voluble, a writer of ten guinea reviews for the American press, and a thoroughly hearty fellow. We talked about the Aran Islands. Then there was Professor Curtis's wife, a very pretty young woman, 15 years younger than the professor. She has just written a pretty novel. She writes short stories and she made violent eyes at me. I walked back to Dublin with her while the professor followed with another young genius. The lady told me all about her life since the year of her birth, including a description of her private life, her love affairs, and her propensity for falling in love with, um, with every interesting person she met. She will be very valuable to Chekhov. A month later, O'Flaherty informed Curtis that I have secured the wife of Prof informed rather he informed Garnet that I have secured the wife of Professor Curtis, which is, of course, the most important conquest. Within a year of these letters being sent, Edmund Curtis would uh, file for divorce from Margaret Barrington. Um, so Margaret Barrington and Liam O'Flaherty were listed as respondent and correspondent in the divorce petition. Uh, actually, in 1925, Curtis had also met with O'Flaherty and Barrington in London in an attempt to persuade Barrington to return to um, the marriage with Curtis. But as Patrick Mahon writes, dismayed at their blithe declaration that they planned to settle in Dublin, which would only cause him more unhappiness, he eventually agreed to a divorce. So that cleared the way for O'Flaherty and Barrington to marry in 1926. O'Flaherty's letters to Garnet, which you can find in um, A. A. Kelly's book, uh, The Collected Letters of Liam O'Flaherty, these letters provide an early insight, or sorry, they provide insights into the early romance of Liam O'Flaherty and Mark Barrington. Um, there, O'Flaherty's writing is admiring, not just for Barrington's beauty, but also encouraging of her literary talents. He wrote to Garnet that he was helping her get her novel into the hands of the publisher Jonathan Cape, and he described her as the little marvel of the literary circle here, on her way to becoming something really good. In December of 1924, he noted that Barrington has been an angel of kindness. Believe me, O'Flaherty told Garnet, I didn't think a woman could, could be so good. I do believe she will make a decent fellow of me yet. We will get to the question of whether Barrington uh, made a decent fellow out of O'Flaherty in time, but first I must mention a shared love that they would have throughout their lives and their daughter, Pegine, who was born a month after their marriage in April of 1926. So what's interesting, I guess, about uh, those letters is that um, Liam O'Friday talks about Margaret Barrington having written a novel. Um, and this seems to be, uh, is almost certainly a different novel to My Cousin Justin. And um, so it raises the potential that there's a sort of, there's a lost Barrington novel um, out there. Maybe, maybe it's recoverable or maybe it's just lost time or maybe it was kind of the, the skeleton that became my cousin Justin. So during the, the first years of their marriage, um, O'Flaherty and Barrington were integrated into that Dublin and London literary scene, and their lives navigated such spaces as the Radical Club at uh, Madame Coley's Cabaret, and the Radical Bookstore run by the German anarchist Charles Lahr in London's Red Line Street. O'Flaherty's literary reputation, of course, at this time was in the ascent, um, in addition to his uh, legendary womanising. There was a, a legend that spread through literary networks in the 1920s that no woman could look into Liam O'Flaherty's lagoon blue eyes without falling under his sway. Uh, Ethel Mammon, a writer and memoirist of the period, once noted that she regretted never encountering O'Flaherty because she had always wanted to prove that legend wrong. The couple and their young daughter travelled extensively, and O'Flaherty in particular had, a, of course, as many of you will know, a, a lifelong aversion to remaining in one place for too long. So let's move forward in time um, to 1928, and we're going to 
look at this young family um, through the eyes of of um, of the diarists uh, whose whose uh, uh, work I kind of came across more or less by accident. Uh, her name uh, was uh, Ione Robinson, who was from Portland, Oregon. She was a an artist traveling in, in the nineteen twenties, the late nineteen twenties, and she wrote in her diary in October nineteen twenty eight. While she was staying in the French coastal town of um, Cannes-sur-Mer, she wrote of a of this town being filled with serious arty types and villagers transporting water in dirty tins um, by donkey and cart. Dwelling on the artists she met in this town, she wrote in her diary, What I do mind is the kind of life artists seem to have to lead. Their artistic poverty is somehow false and different from the simple, healthy poverty of the peasants. When I was in school, I liked all of the same things as the other girls in my class, but now that I have decided to be a painter, I never meet other painters who like to do the simple things I like. The only artistic person in Cannes who shows any enthusiasm for real fun is an Irish writer named Liam O'Flaherty, and even he drinks too much. He took me to the horse races in Nice, but at the races he started to drink and ended up not being able to see the horses. His wife was crying all the time and their small daughter stood watching the races with me. So that diary entry is, is a very um, short and contained snapshot of O'Flaherty and Barrington's life together with their daughter Pegine. Um, and perhaps it's revealing of a fraying relationship. Um, a relationship uh, fraying influenced by, of course, O'Flaherty's um, drinking, but also potentially his womanizing as well. Let's return then to um, Margaret Barrington's 1939 novel, My Cousin Justin. Um, the online database for Corso, which is a, just a really wonderful resource, notes that the novel is uh, in part based on her relationship with O'Flaherty. It certainly seems the case that the character of Egan O'Doherty in the novel, um, who's the love interest of the narrator uh, and a, a man of action who believes the Irish Revolution will be the first step in the path to a global socialist revolution. Um, this character does bear a resemblance to O'Flaherty's personality and biography, but if we're um, considering that this character of Egan O'Doherty is a is a one to one reflection of both O'Flaherty and and Barrington's thoughts on who O'Flaherty was, writing in nineteen thirty nine, several years after their separation, then it's it's a decidedly unflattering portrait. The character um, Tom in the novel warns Luli against falling in love with Egan O'Doherty. If there's one thing a man hates doing. Uh, notes Tom, is warning a woman against another man, particularly when that man is a friend of his. It makes him feel such a prig. As I said, I've got nothing against him. I like his cold, clear, ruthless intelligence. I admire his capacity for deceiving others and yet not for a moment deceiving himself. He has a quality which draws my heart towards him. And when I look at him, I see something in those beautiful blue eyes I only see in the eyes of a woman. So again, um, the old blue eyes. Uh, inescapable. But to those who do not understand him, to women especially, he is as unscrupulous and treacherous as a rattlesnake. So by the early 1930s, um, O'Farity and Barrington uh, were separated. Uh, they would never officially divorce. Barrington, uh, Margaret Barrington moved to London and Liam O'Farity took off across the world, uh, first to the USSR and then to the US of A. Pegin uh, stayed with their mother and also entered boarding school in England. So London provided new horizons for Barrington's literary and political work. In London, Barrington contributed to the BBC, the leftist magazine Tribune, which has recently uh, been revived, and assisted refugees fleeing fascism, and she also supported Republican Spain. Many of those refugees, of course, were coming in from Spain. She also contributed her language skills to leftist causes. At one point, um, her daughter Pegine remembered, Barrington sponsored so many refugees coming to London, telling them, you know, here, take my um, flat address and, and use it as your address on your form. Um, she had done this with so many refugees that a representative uh, from the, council, from the um, sanitary office came along to the flat to investigate overcrowding, believing that this, this flat was heaving with tens of, of, of refugees from continental Europe. At the end of this decade in 1930s and 1939, My Cousin Justin, 
was published to acclaim and that was published in the US um, as Turn Ever Northward. I just have kind of a fun story about my own copy of My Cousin Justin. I actually didn't have one, a personal copy, until recently I used to access the copy in my university library. Um, but uh, just a few days ago, before I wrote this, the, this talk, I was in my local Super Value here in Care County Tipperary and there's a book donation box there, which is usually about 25% Dan Brown novels. But sitting on top of the pile of the book donation box was this copy of My Cousin Justin. So almost as though um, we can consider this, this talk as uh, ordained by the universe itself. So with the outbreak then of the Second World War, to bring us back from my own personal life to our, our biographical narrative, um, so with the outbreak of the Second World War, Barrington returned to Ireland, where she remained until her death. She continued to write and contributed to Irish cultural journals, including The Bell, for many decades. In 1982, she died as a final collection of her short stories was due to be published, titled David's Daughter, Tamar. And you may be able to find copies of each of her works secondhand, relatively easy. Um, um, there, uh, but also you can find her more readily available short stories um, through the republications. Uh, firstly, in the Glass Shore, uh, short stories from north of, from the north of Ireland, and the Arthur the Glimpse, which are both edited by Shane Gleason. Um, I wanted to conclude uh, similar to my, uh, I wanted to conclude by. Um, Returning to the 1920s, a moment of potential for people like Barrington O'Flaherty and those like them who imagined a very different Ireland to the one that emerged. As the narrator Luli in My Cousin Justin notes, we hoped that out of the struggle the working class would seize power. It was a smoke dream. So it's that crossroads in our history which fascinates me and which makes the lives of, of brilliant radical intellectuals like Margaret Barrington so worthwhile recovering. Each step on her path through the 20th century speaks to her independent mindedness, principled politics, and artistic gifts. Um, her work uh, deserves to have, have wider recognition today, and it's it's great that um, authors like uh, Sinead Beeson are, are championing championing her once more. And perhaps who knows, one day the um, the tables of O'Flaherty and Barrington's uh, popularity may turn. We might speak of Liam O'Flaherty as the second husband of Margaret Barrington and an Irish writer. So um, thank you, that, that's, that's really all from me, but I'm of course very happy as ever to hear from you. Um, every, every so often since uh, I had an article on Margaret Barrington published in Tribune magazine last year, and that article has led to uh, a few emails from people interested in, in Margaret Barrington. So more or less, uh, everything that I've spoken of um, in this talk are, are all the details I can find on Margaret Barrington. It's very difficult to trace her in uh, different archives, but I hope other researchers will have more success than me. Particularly interested in her work in terms of Spanish Civil War and refugee advocacy, which you often see mentioned, but uh, very hard to find sort of um, uh, more detailed accounts of, of what precisely she was doing and, and um, what groups she was, she was working alongside. They also think because you know this is a woman who died in 1982 not that long ago there must also be a lot of living memory of her in west cork so i'd be very interested to hear of anyone who, who might um who might even remember her uh so as i say you know do get in touch if you have any further info on barrington or just any questions about what i have discussed here um, i'm gonna uh, put my uh, email address somewhere in this video so it should pop up on screen right now but uh, that's all for me. So until we all meet again on the our until we all meet again in the bar on Inishmore, I'm gonna say Slán, August Scott, Rev, Mila, Mahagrub, Galer.